Anderson, they're leading scenarios and they're all bad. Let's bring in the map and talk about what we know. Remember, points of reference here. We know a week and a half ago the plane took off from Kuala Lumpur, flew for less than an hour, and then vanished off the coast here, headed toward Vietnam. And everything else since then has been conjecture. All of these search areas, everything based on just ideas of what might have happened, including the latest idea from that satellite suggesting that maybe there's an arc to the north or an arc to the south upon which signals were received from this plane. So how could it have landed if it headed to the south? Where could it have gone? Are there possibilities out there? Yeah, there are airports at places like Bande Aceh or maybe in Western Australia, maybe some place like Christmas Island out there. It's not easily done, though, and partially because of the requirements of this airplane. It's got to have 4,000 feet of runway minimum if it's going to land safely somewhere, 6,000 to take off. It's got to have some kind of support services. Any place out here that has an airport that can handle it and all this water is also going to have people, maybe only a couple of hundred, but those people all would have to be part of this or be quiet or else somebody hears about it. So the southern route is not very promising. So let's talk about the idea of the northern route and what may or may not be involved with that. If you look at the idea that it flew north somehow off this line or along this line, Look at the places it's passing, Cambodia, Myanmar, Thailand, China, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan. Could there be holes in radar there? Could there be incomplete coverage, people not paying a lot of attention? Sure, there could be. Could there be countries there that don't want to tell much about what they know because of their own national security? Absolutely. But all of them? Would all of them do that? And could it get out that way? It doesn't look that likely. So then you're left with even more surprising ideas or confusing ideas one of which is very popular for people to talk about right now, which is the idea that this plane managed to essentially go into a stealth mode by flying in the shadow, the radar shadow, of another jet. So some jet out here is flying with all of its systems turned on, normal commercial flight, and it's flying on radar, fully watched by everyone. This one has nothing turned on, so it can't be seen by radar, and it also can't be seen by this plane because it's flying slightly behind it, it's not tracked in any way, shape, or form, and together, they come together and form like one dot on the radar signal. Officials have been asked about this possibility, and they've said, yeah, I guess it's possible. You need an incredibly skilled pilot to pull it off. Even then, the dot would probably be bigger or more intense than usual and could attract the attention of a radar operator somewhere. But Anderson, when people try to figure out beyond what we know, that initial flight, into all this conjecture, how it could have happened, theories like this have to be considered no matter how outlandish, simply because here we are a week and a half later and we just don't know. Yeah, and these are certainly things that investigators, from, you know, every country who's involved in this, uh, are certainly looking at it and trying to play out uh, the many steps of what it would entail. Tom, appreciate it. I want to bring in John Hansman, a professor of aeronautics and astronautics at MIT, also back with us as airline pilot uh, Jim Tillman. Professor Hansen, uh, of all the theories out there about what may have happened, at this point, which seem most plausible to, to you? Well, you know, we, we got to keep everything on the table, but, you know, a couple of days ago, everybody rejected the, you know, catastrophic failure idea and now it's back on the table and I think that's that's certainly credible. The original turn back was towards the uh, closest uh, available airport so that makes sense. Um, uh, so the initial part actually makes sense in some sort of catastrophic problem. And when you say catastrophic, um, you, do, you don't mean sense. instantaneous, you mean mechanical yeah, yeah. issues on board that then the pilot had time to try to make that, that turn to try to uh, find uh, the closest sure. airport. Yeah, some sort of progressive problem like smoke in the cockpit. If you had an electrical fire in the avionics bay or something like that, you would have turned to the nearest airport, which would have made sense. And you know, under that hypothesis, if they became incapacitated or if there was a flight control problem, but if there was a flight control problem, they still would have had the radio. You know, so it's hard to figure out. What really doesn't make sense on that though was if they did become incapacitated and the airplane was flying along. It would normally continue in the direction it was going because it would have been programmed uh, either in the flight management computer or just in heading hold mode to kind of track that heading. Um, so the fact that it appears that it had turned either to the north or to the south doesn't really jive with, with that uh, theory. Uh, there is still the idea of a hijack uh, of some sort. Um, 
either an intruder or the crew. Uh, and you know, that's sort of where we are. We're still just waiting, looking for enough data to make a, a reasonable conclusion. Jim Tillman, how accurate do you think this, this radar information is that, that, that has been released? I mean, do you believe? Because a lot of it is not clear cut, this was the plane. It's interpreting information that they were getting. Well, I don't mean to uh, say bad things about people, but I really don't trust any of that. I mean, I keep getting all of these these crazy stories about uh, what the radar was picking up and what it wasn't picking up, and hey, do you have radar contact or not? And I also wonder, you know, I've been critical of, of air traffic control since this thing started. Where were they? Well, why aren't they asking, you know, this, this airplane to squawk ident? so that we can identify them and everything else. Why aren't they asking, what are your intentions? Why aren't they creating the conversation? OK. An airline flying over land, you would think, would sort of certainly raise that, uh, the, those types of communications from air traffic controllers. Uh, we got to leave there. Jim Tillman, John Hansman, thank you very much. Up next, we're going to talk to a grief counselor who has been talking to the families uh, of the missing. Uh, imagine, I mean, as closely as people have been following this, what it is like for them with this constantly shifting information from Malaysian authorities. We'll hear from him ahead. Paul Lin joins us from, Be from Beijing. You've been talking to some of the families who have loved ones aboard this flight. I, the, the not knowing and the conflicting information for them must be just devastating. Absolutely. I think it's the most uh, unusual situation here. I work with the uh, families and victims of the uh, Asiana crash last year in San Francisco. And that was difficult. But this, uh, the experience I got from that is of really very little use today because uh, uh, grief counseling or uh, uh, we say uh, any kind of uh, recovery from this has to have a starting point. And the starting point is knowing, uh, having a verdict of what happened. And without a starting point, uh, every day people's emotion go up and down from hope to despair, and uh, basically they're going hour by hour, by hour not day by day. Mm, sometimes minute by minute, I imagine. What, what um, are, are many of the families that you've Absolutely. talked to holding on to, to hope that, that their loved ones are still alive? I mean, that, that's clearly got to be, given the, all the conflicting information, that has to be something that they are very seriously considering. Well, actually, perhaps you more so than you think, because uh, when, they, uh, when the word came out that uh, we're basically considering hijacking as the uh, most possible scenario, there was, uh, among many of the families, almost euphoria, because uh, that means they could still be alive. Mm. And uh, I heard cheers. And the, their uh, response is so, uh, I think, out of what we consider to be uh, the normal response, because they're trying to hold on to any little, little bit of hope and they are enlarging it in their, in, in their mind. And I even have someone say to me, so when my son come home, you know, I'll take you out to dinner. Mm. Um, well, Paul, I appreciate you, you being on. And again, uh, thank you for what you are doing in all of this and all the, the counselors who are working with these families. Again, uh, it's an unthinkable situation. Let me ask uh, Greg about another one that blew up today online. This uh, hobbyist aviator uh, looked at other flight paths in this area, okay. uh, on the Mal Malacca Strait and all of that, and found a Singapore Airlines 777 that was flying a certain way. Okay. And the theory he floated was, what if Flight 370 sort of, you know, did a little slipstreaming, yeah. got in the shadow of that, and where it would pass itself off as one plane without that plane in front of him knowing? Possible? It's possible. Probable? Is, I would say crazy. that's a question for a pilot. How close are you willing to fly to the other plane? You know, it's definitely possible. You, you'd also have to understand the waveforms used by the other radar. Are they sending a really long waveform or a little certain little waveform? Right. If it's little, then it'd be very hard to do. David Succi, what do you think of this one, this theory? Yeah, I, I think it's highly possible to do that. In fact, it's been done before. Mary Schiavo reported on that, I think, this morning on CNN that uh, it has been done before, and we've got people researching to find out specifically when that was and what flight it was. But uh, in order to do that, you would, as, as uh, your previous guest mentioned, that you, you'd have to have very extremely good pilot skills, and you'd have to know what type of radar is looking at you to know how close you'd have to be. 
But I'm not underestimating any of this. I do think that there's foul play here, and I'm not underestimating what it would take to have the, quali to have the system's knowledge to do what they've done. This is highly planned, it's highly skilled people trying to put this together. I don't see any other way it would, so I'm not underestimating the capabilities of whoever is pulling this off. Are there, are there levels of trust uh, in terms of radar in these countries, you know, in terms of sophistication? We think everything's cutting edge, but are there some pre-Soviet era radar systems here? There could be anything out there. I mean, unfortunately, you can't Google radar systems in China and find yeah. out what they are. They don't, <laughs> that's very, Protected information, but, but a lot of stuff tends to be very old, yeah. It tends to be old, and sometimes they shut it down at night to save money. Yeah, I mean, you might have a mean time between failure and the order of 500 to 1,000 hours. You could have old equipment where you have two of them in one site, so you could, you know, keep one going while the other one's being repaired. These are all possibilities, yeah. but if you design the, you know, if they, they did it right, they, they, they've accounted for this stuff. Spider Marks, what are, can we trust their radar? Can we trust the Malaysian military's radar when they say, we saw something uh, across the sky. We weren't sure exactly what it was uh, on its way to the Indian Ocean. you believe that? Well, speak, yeah, well, speaking to an expert today, I understand Malaysia, within the last year, upgraded their radar system. Mm. So, if we can put, so if we can put on the table that they had the very latest state of the art, then you get into whether it worked or it didn't work based on the operator. Mm -hmm. And at 1.30 in the morning, was it on? Was anybody looking at it? I mean, having spent a whole host of my life during those very, very dark hours, I can, un I can understand how there might be somebody who won't necessarily be the number one guy who's got his head or her head in the game at that very moment. So with this, um, but with this again, upgraded system, too. let me ask you this, though. With that upgraded system, is, it, is there a recorder on there? Or do you, if you go out to get a cup of coffee and you miss the blip crossing the screen, you missed it? Uh, you, you might miss it at that moment, but all that would be downloaded, and that would be available for forensic. You could go back forensically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Uh, interesting. Got, thank you so much. Greg, appreciate your insights.